Hey all here OS Reviews. I always love looking at quirky, unique smartphones which stand out from the crowd. One of the brands in particular that we've seen over the past few weeks has been Unihertz as part of their TikTok series that has a secondary display on the back. Meanwhile, one can argue that foldable form factors are also novel and quirky as well. So today we're taking a look at another kind of unique smartphone from the folks at Unihertz. This is going to be their Jelly 2E. The claim to fame of this particular device is it's the world's smallest Android smartphone released in 2022 with a teeny tiny 3 inch display, but still it's a fully functioning device. Now if the name feels familiar, that's because Unihertz have made a few Jelly Ultra Compact phones already, including the original Jelly 2 that came out last year. It's a lighter version of the original Jelly 2 in terms of having a slightly slower processor. This one here is the MediaTek A20 chip, coupled with 4GB of RAM as well as 64 gigs of built-in storage, which are both a bit lower than the original Jelly 2 that had 6 gigs of RAM for instance but as a result you're also getting a phone uh, which is cheaper by about 50 bucks and perhaps more importantly it now runs on Android 12 instead of Android 11 so you have a slightly cleaner OS experience but otherwise retains very similar di design and dimensions. Packaging contents are inclusive of a TPU soft carrying case, a nice freebie that is also just super cute to protect your phone. It also comes with a lanyard hook at the very bottom of the case because this device also comes with its own tiny keychain lanyard, quite cute. And also we have just a standard Type-C cable for charging, syncing, and a wall adapter along with a quick user guide. We also have access to a 2000 milliamp hour capacity battery. We still have a 16 megapixel rear facing camera along the 8 megapixel selfie lens on the front and a fingerprint scanner as well. Now again the design remains almost completely unchanged from the original too, although the color on the back is a little different. The original was more of a metallic blue that was shiny. This one is replaced by a more plain gray, although both are non-user removable in terms of the battery inside, along with being made of a polycarbonate plastic. The entire thing again weighs around 110 grams, so very light. On the spine you have access to the Type-C port for charging. There's a dual SIM card slot, so yes you can pop in two 4G SIM cards or use the second one to expand on the built-in memory. You also get a remappable hotkey on the side there, which by default, if you long press for a few seconds, can trigger the flashlight, but can also be used to open other programs under the settings, which I do really like. A dedicated power key, bottom houses just a single speaker, and the top has a standard 3.5mm headphone jack and an IR blaster. Pretty incredible to see that on a essentially credit card sized phone, Overall, the phone feels actually quite nice in the hand, not too cheap or flimsy. The front, by the way, also houses the earpiece, and down below we have capacitive keys, which have become more and more rare to find these days on newer Android phones, but you have the ability to essentially go back home, open up the multitasking drawer, and go back by one page if you don't want to rely on gesture controls, which of course, since it is running on Android 12, you can opt for instead. Now we'll take a closer look at the UI and performance next, but I did want to do a quick size comparison of this phone against some other devices, just to show how tiny it really is. Here they are next to standard AirPods or headphones. You can tell they're really just about twice the length of that. Here we have again a simple AA battery, which even seems comparable in size. Even something like a foldable phone, such as a Razer or a Galaxy Z Flip, will seem much larger, heavier by contrast. Compared to older phones of yesteryear, such as the original kind of iPhones, which had a 3.5 inch display, you can tell that the screen here is actually not too far off, but because they've been able to minimize the bezels by so much, it just seems so much more compact as a result. It's even more hilarious when we put it next to an average standard smartphone here in 2022. But like I said, it is a fully functioning Android smartphone, despite how tiny it is and perhaps nostalgic in a way, since it harkens back to the days of the first touchscreen phones from more than a decade ago. But if we squint and look a little bit closer, as aforementioned, we do have a very clean version of Android 12, just scaled on something so much smaller. Everything still feels relatively responsive when it comes to navigating around, despite the fact that it's not really a powerful full processor, it still is sufficient since there's less pixels also to push around on the screen, although you notice the occasional moments of hesitation here to there, but overall it really is not bad. And we have installed all of the standard Google apps out of the box, including access to the essentials like the Play Store, YouTube, and you also get a handful of toolbox features which have been common stay on Unihertz phones, although this device in particular really isn't a rugged phone, it still gives you a few extras such as 
checking out what is the noise level around you using the microphone. It's a decibel meter. There's a basic compass. There's a heart rate monitor, which by the way uses the camera and the flash to approximate uh, your beats per minute. You do also get an FM radio, by the way, which makes use of the headphone jack to act as the antenna. That also extends to Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth, all the usuals. The one thing I will say here is on the 2E, Bluetooth version is technically 4.2. So it's one other area where they cut down on costs by using a slightly older gen chip. We take a quick look here at the camera, which again at 16 megapixels remains the same resolution and sensor as the original 2E. It's not shabby, I would say, especially for something that is so small, although there is no built-in HDR by default under the settings that I'm currently seeing, though it does give you again some additional properties that you can play around with. As far as recording video is concerned, you can also record up to full HD resolution, uh, really without any problems. To illustrate, here are a few shots that I captured earlier when there's plenty of lighting around you. You still get a decent amount of detail, at least it is a autofocus lens. Colors look all right, but I do think they can be a little bit more saturated looking at times. Right now I do think it's still a little on the cold side as far as the color temperature, but it's nothing that you can't adjust by yourself afterwards. Takeaway here being that for something I would say so small, it gets the job done, but you can tell how, of course, it's not going to be a match with an iPhone or a Pixel, but that's kind of to be expected for a, again, phone of this size and budget price range overall. You can still get some satisfactory results as long as you have patience with it and you don't expect miracles, especially under lower light environments. That's where it will struggle a bit more. Now again, this display I overall think looks pretty sharp for what it is and at the very least it is a fully laminated screen and has pretty decent viewing angles as you can see there and also decent outdoor visibility for something so small. And one thing I was surprised about is the overall responsiveness of the screen is also quite decent. You are still able to type things out despite how kind of tiny it may look in something like The Verge, and you can tell that overall it's not bad. With a little bit of patience and practice, uh, you will actually be able to get to a decent enough speed, granted never as fast as on a device with a bigger keyboard, but serviceable. You can of course use the accelerometer and use the landscape keyboard, but again if you are someone that's constantly typing out essays and emails, then that probably isn't going to be the best choice on a tiny phone. But here it is, a quick demo of the web browsing capabilities, which is doing all right. You'll notice some occasional moments of jumpiness, but at the very least, apps and web pages will still load, including The Verge, which is a relatively complex site. You just have to navigate around a little bit more in terms of scrolling and often zooming in a bit more to get a closer view of what you are trying to see, but for the most part, it is surprisingly usable. Now we can also jump into a quick demo of what the speakers sound like using YouTube. So some takeaways being that the speaker is actually impressively not that easy to muffle or cover up because it's also coming up from some grills on the side, even though it is a single speaker. And although it doesn't get the loudest, I would say it doesn't distort either at higher volume levels and certainly does a little better than you'd expect coming from such a tiny phone. It actually is fine for watching back some quick clips um, on YouTube and whatnot. Plus you can always use regular headphones or Bluetooth wireless headphones or speakers to further improve the experience. Again, media consumption, I wouldn't say it's really the best experience on something so tiny at the end of the day, but it's also serviceable, surprisingly. You can definitely still get by and make out what's happening on screen with enough vividness in the colors that some quick clips that you're maybe watching or podcasts can still be a good enough experience. Picture and picture mode are also supported, so you get this floating window Window, or if you want to do some multitasking, yes, that can be found on here by default with Android 12. But again, keep in mind the tiny screen size that you have to work with. Uh, it's probably not going to be the best idea in the world. Now coming into some other essentials, such as uh, the storage space. Now out of the box, you get around 52 gigabytes of memory after the OS has been installed. But again, you can further supplement that using the SD card slot on the side, which is good. Battery life, again, at 2000 milliamp hours may not seem that huge on paper, but factoring in the size of the phone, the fact that you probably don't wanna be always touching it due to the smaller compact nature, just checking out calls occasionally, 
some basic notifications, and it lasted me around four days before I needed to recharge it again. But the point being that they packed in pretty much as big of a battery as they could in this form factor. Now some other essentials, such as making phone calls, was also all right on here. The microphone sounded clean enough as far as picking up my voice, even though it's a little bit further away from your mouth. So if you are in windy or extremely loud environments, it will also pick up a little bit more background echo, but not too bad for the most part and still gets a decent antenna reception uh, because of the polycarbonate frame. So no issues in terms of staying connected to T-Mobile's 4G LTE networks in my test. But last but not least, talking a bit more about the gaming performance. Overall, I would say it's never gonna be a true gaming centric phone, keeping in mind this tiny size. It's all about that compactness and ultra portability, but basic games such as Stack, as you can see there, which are more lightweight on the animations do work all right. There's not too much stuttering going on, surprisingly. Although when you first load up the titles, it might take a split second longer compared to more powerful devices, but not bad. Definitely is more than playable, at least for simpler titles like this. Now, once you start going into heavier games, things like Asphalt or PUBG, that's definitely not going to be the best idea on the Jelly 2E, keeping in mind that, again, it's a pretty entry-level processor and GPU combination. It does work in a pinch, although I would just recommend slightly lighter games if you are trying to play them back. Some small moments of hesitation there, expected due to the GPU and CPU package, but for the most part, still getting you a overall pleasant enough experience, considering this thing is not that much bigger than a smartwatch at the end of the day. Oh, so that's more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Unihertz Jelly 2E. I've been pleasantly surprised, despite the super tiny form factor, which again, it's not going to resonate with everyone these days. In fact, it's a pretty niche audience that are looking for an ultra-compact phone these days, as the norm is getting towards bigger screens, more immersive for video content. But if you are someone that is a little annoyed by these giant bricks that are hard to carry around in your pocket, or perhaps more realistically, you're looking for a travel companion phone, a secondary phone, in case your primary one dies or you're just using it in a pinch to make calls, then it's really not a bad idea. It actually harkens back to something like the Palm phone with much more powerful and updated specs compared to the actual tiny phones of yesteryear and surprisingly fully functional for what it is. Of course, again, it's still going to be something a little bit more of a novelty, more of a minimalist phone rather than something that will do for the vast majority of folks out there. But if you happen to fall into the target demographic, you find the idea of a tiny phone appealing, then I have to say the 2E really is not a bad idea. And at the end of the day, I think diversity of any kind should be welcome as it will provide just more variety for us as consumers to pick from. So I think that more than anything else is what makes me excited about this phone after taking a look at big phones for so long. You can check out more details in the links below if interested. For now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been the Jelly 2E.